If you want to know the true measure of a man, watch what he does with power. Kenyan historian tells the story of the nation's third president. Regarded as a gentleman of Kenya's rough political landscape, Emilio Mwai Kibaki discharged every bit the oddity of a polished city man whose backcloth had successful academic trails. Great things were foretold of a young economist who in the early 1960 was plugged from Makerere University to work for Kano as the party's first executive officer. Iwanda vijengwe kote katika Kenya na sio tu katika miji mikubwa ya Kenya vile Nairobi na Mombasa. And after a long walk great things came his way. Mimi mwai kibaki na hapa kwamba nitatenda kazi zangu za urais wa Jamhuri ya Kenya kwa uaminifu It is now my greatest pleasure to introduce to you the next president of the Republic of Kenya Tulipoanza ilikuwa tu kwamba sisi tuliamini lazima tupate jia ya kuunganisha wana Kenya in early 2002 Mwai Kibaki's presidential pursuit looked feeble a complicated opposition unity was a liability ili tufaulu na tutimize yale tulitaka kutimiza 1992 na 1997 na hatukuweza kuyatimiza kwa sababu tulikuwa tumegawanyika and the ruling party kanu appeared stronger having swallowed Raila Odinga's NDP <laughs> and Mike Kibaki was struggling to form a united front together with Ford Kenya's Wamalo Kijana and SDP's Charity Ngilu. Almost every single party has had no reservation whatsoever regarding the need for us to get rid of Moi. Kibaki had suffered significant setbacks in his quest for state house. But he knew 2002 was a matter of now or never. He had survived the rough political terrain in the 1970s and 1980s. But the race to succeed Daniel Arap Moy needed his cool demeanor coupled with wit and intelligence. So in my approach to any problem, I'm seeking always to a way that we can do it together rather than some friends of mine who think that if you have a contrary opinion, their mission is to make sure they knock you down and you're out of their way, they think you're blocking. He needed to outsmart his challengers to become Kenya's third president in December 2002. Mistakes people have made in the past should not distract us from confronting the enormous challenges ahead. One would have preferred to overlook some of the all too obvious human errors and forge ahead, but it would be unfair to Kenyans not to raise questions. Life in government and in the opposition had introduced the gentlemen of Kenya's rough political landscape to different intrigues and political games 
including the contest for the country's top political seat, the presidency. His public life had prepared him for this moment. It means in effect that Kenyans have given me a challenge to go ahead and fulfill all those things that I personally have been promising and that our party has been promising. Kibaki's walk to the house on the hill began even before he knew it. His first strides were made as Kenya prepared to usher in the first black-led government. The day the young economist was appointed to serve the government of Muzei Joma Kenyatta is the day the smell of power and influence hit him. But for the man who ruled Kenya for 10 years, life began on the morning of 15th November 1931 in Gatuyani village of Dhaya, Nyeri County. He was the youngest child of Kibaki Gidinji and Teresio Anjiku. In his early years, Kibaki exhibited incredible aptitude and intelligence. Yeah, as missionaries scouted for children to take to school, young Kibaki was picked by his polygamous father. He was the youngest and was the least useful in the shamba, and so his father thought. As fate has it, Kibaki turned out to be one of the most useful economists in the country. He acquired formal education up to university. Although identified by the international media as a world leader, he chose not to take the trodden path. Instead, he opted for the uncharted path of an independent Kenya and leave a trail. And this is what the 29-year-old Kibaki did. In the 1960s, he quit his teaching position at Makerere University to pursue his political dream, joining the then dominant political party, Kenya African National Union, KANU. Jermogi went to Kampala as a guest of President Milton Obote. I found Obote was campaigning with a very beautiful manifesto. I asked him, how who prepared this manifesto for you? Obote said, there are some young men here in Makarere who are very good. Their leader is a secular Kenyan. Then Jermogi said, I want to see him. He brought Mwai Kibaki. He brought Mwai Kibaki. Jermogi told him, I want you to do the same, same manifesto like this for Kanu. And he prepared with his team that beautiful manifesto. And that's how Jermogi now invited him to come and become executive of officer of Kanu. If his professor at Makerere University was right, Honorable Mwai Kibaki had the hope of becoming the first African president of the World Bank, a much safer and a much more assured path. But he rejected this dream in pursuit of a more challenging vision. At this time, the Kenya African Democratic Union, KADU, was rising. Composed of minority groups, the party, led by Ronald Gala, complicated the political matrix for Kano. In 1960, Moi, together with the late Ronald Gala, founded the Kenya African Democratic Union, KADU. The aim of the party was to defend the rights of the smaller ethnic groupings in the face of the Kikuyu and the Luo, who are the majority in Kano. Kano had been registered on June 11, 1960. 
and five months into its troubled existence, Mwai Kibaki was hired to put things in order at the headquarters. And it showed my own commitment because at that particular time, it was not relevant whether you are paid or not paid. We had to work, work very hard, because we believed we were committed to the achievement of independence. In 1961, Kano emerged victorious after getting 19 out of 33 elective seats in the House of Representatives. A win that left Mboya and Kibaki hugging and jumping with Kenyatta in the background. Kibaki's role and style of politics became apparent. My political style is incompatible with the intrigues, manipulation, political manipulation, dishonesty of this country. Mwai is a thorough gentleman. He is a, his style of politics is more British. We must show the world that some of them have been wrong, that some of them have misunderstood us, and it's only by our action, they will know that we mean business. In 1963, he contested the Donham seat and was appointed Parliamentary Secretary to the Treasury. Donham was the constituency where the African middle class and politicians were living. After Kenya gained independence in 1963, Mzee Kenyatta appointed Kibaki, the Assistant Minister for Economic Planning and Development. I wish to extend a very warm welcome to all the participants of this session of the Customs Cooperation Council, which has convened today in Nairobi. As expected of a young and vulnerable government, irreversible cracks emerged. And by 1966, the fallout between President Jomo Kenyatta and Vice President Oginga Odinga had reached a point of no return. The problem actually was friends of Kenyatta. They advised for development to, to go to their places. That Odinga was defending. He was um, opposed to. So Odinga went out, he was saying they were, they were not being developed. And uh, we always agreed. But then it was people who were very close to Kenyatta, who were very serving, very inward looking. When Oginga and his group left government to form the opposition outfit, Kenya People's Union, KPU, Kibaki was promoted into a full minister. On 3rd May 1966, he was made Minister for Commerce and Industry. He literally took over the strongest pillars of the East African Union. If you want to know the true measure of a man, watch what he does with power. How he handles his opponents, how he treats his wife and family, and what he does with his influence. In 1969, Kibaki's friend, Tom Boyer, was murdered as he came out of a chemist along Moy Avenue. In the elections that followed Boyer's death, Kibaki almost lost his Donham seat to one giant Bogo. In a tactical retreat in 1974, he shifted base to his home constituency of Odaya in Nyeri. 
Kibaki became the reliable Kenyatta minister. And his appointment as Minister for Finance in 1969 displayed the trust that Jomo Kenyatta had in him. He kept away from the group from Kenyatta's Kiambu backyard who built a wall around the president, but his respectability as an economist helped him fight for his place in the post-independence government. During his tenure at the National Treasury, the country's economy recorded a tremendous growth. World Bank President Robert McNamara described him as one of the greatest economic brains to have emerged from Africa. The light President Kibaki lit will never flicker out because his torch continues in the lives of millions. And in 1977, the influential Time magazine saw a great potential in him. As Kenyatta's health deteriorated, a group of central Kenya politicians hatched a plan to deter Moi's ascension to power. They wanted the constitution changed. They called themselves Kiambu Mafia, but Kibaki joined hands with Moi and Attorney General Charles Njonjo to form their own camp of constitutionalists. And when Mze Jomo Kenyatta breathed his last, Charles Njonjo, through sheer will and craftiness, saw the spirit and later of the constitution invoked the same day. Moi became president and appointed Mike Kibaki his vice president. And after 90 days, Kibaki supported the election of Daniel Arap Moi as Kenya's second president. And properly supported in accordance with the constitution by 1,000 Kenyans properly registered in various constituencies in all the parts of Kenya. The Kiambu Mafia wanted Moi's presidency to be short-lived. They called him a passing cloud, but Moi kept winning, and it was a sign of what was to come. Brutal, skimming, anything goes. Moi wanted Kenyatta masses on his side, and so he coined the slogan, Nyayo, a Swahili equivalent for footsteps. He promised to walk in the footsteps of Muse Jomo Kenyatta. But as time went by, Moi shifted the content of his philosophy to suit his own style. Moi's way of running a government was eventually, he made the final decision himself. He also retained much of Kenyatta's men, and more so, Charles Njonjo, the man who fought to ensure he became president. Also at the heart of his cabinet was like keep your politician, Gigi Karuki, and the man who would later succeed him as president, Emilio Mwaikibaki. Riding in a presidential limousine became their trademark. In 1981, the Time magazine again named him among its annual top 100 people who could lead the world in various capacities. But the 1982 attempted coup changed Moy forever. 1982 uh, coup uh, changed Moi's strategy completely uh, because it even it rearranged his priorities. Uh, before then, he was 
uh, he was his, his approach to public life, public uh, affairs was different from after the coup. Because after the coup, he realized that he had enemies within. So he, he had to try and reorganize the government to his own liking. He became more brutal. In 1984, when I sensed what was going on, and we could see the changes that have begun to set in, that is was the right moment we should have resigned. In Moy's cabinet, he was initially entrusted with a finance portfolio, but Kibaki increasingly found himself at odds with then-president Daniel Arap Moy. He was dropped as vice president in 1988 after an attempt to rig him out of the Odaya seat failed. Josephat Karanja replaced him and he was transferred to the Ministry of Health. No reason was given for his demotion. Popular voices countrywide wanted him to reject what they saw as a humiliation and resign from government altogether. But he shunned the voices of the crowds and opted for the lonely and unpopular path then. To the shock of the nation, he embraced his demotion with grace and continued to serve the country in a lesser capacity. During this time, the clamor for change and civil unrest was increasing among the people of Kenya. Dissenting voices against Moi's oppressive policies had become bolder and louder. More people were saying, if you can see really a long line being declared the loser and the small line, the short line, being declared the winner, there is really something wrong in our political spectrum. We need to change it so that it is the majority that takes the day. But once a multi-party system was introduced in 1991, a move he initially opposed. GP! GP! Kibaki jumped ship. I have resigned from the government and that a statement will be issued tomorrow. He was criticized by Ford members for failing to join their party. His move to form DP played a significant role in the split that followed the Forum for Restoration of Democracy, Ford. The yeah, special branch was now why, uh, well aware of, of the discussions and the divisions that were emerging from Ford. So quite a number of them traveled to, uh, to the United Kingdom and told Matiba that, you know, this is your chance. Uh, and, and, and secondly, you know, they told him that, you know, if he did not take his chance, then, then Mwai Kibaki was going to, to eclipse him. Uh, uh, and uh, Matiba was taken in, uh, but not absolutely, until the day when he came back and was received uh, in a way that I don't think a leader has been received in Kenya until uh, the time when Raila also was received. Every status quo situation, it uses a method that will scatter the opposition. Jaramogi Odinga is slightly older than Kenneth Matiba. So you put into the head of Kenneth Matiba that it is time for Jaramogi Odinga, Odinga to go where? Go home. So when he's coming, I'm younger and he's old and he has had his time. He needs to go away. So that's what was done. Kenneth Matiba was given that impression just by some statements, some statements. And then when he came, he had a very good reception at the airport, our president. Now, when he saw that reception, every politician, by the way, is moved by the ground. The one who came with 
And then they come waving. They were blackguards, waving him to be the president. The first thing he did when he now landed in Ford was a big quorum with Jaramogi Odin. And that trap caused, caused a split in Ford. Then you ended up having Ford Kenya, and then you now ended up having, having Ford uh, Asili. He came third in the 1992 multi-party elections that saw Moi secure 1.9 million votes, <laughs> Kenneth Matiba 1.4 million, and him over 1 million votes. In the opposition, Kibaki distinguished himself in parliament once again as an astute debater and voice of reason, and he continued to shape his politics and his bid to oust Moe from power. After coming second to Daniel Arap Moe in the 1997 elections, Kibaki became official leader of the opposition. But the man from Odaya was not done yet. His quest for the presidency remained alive till 2002 as he prepared another stab. <laughs> Moi was retiring and the chance of succeeding him looked promising. But the Kano political machinery was so strong for a disjointed opposition to dislodge it from power. He started negotiating for a joint assault from the opposition. In came Ford Kenya's Michael Kijana Omalua and SDP's Charity Ngilu. They formed NAK, National Alliance of Kenya. His dream would get a boost after Kanu split following Moi's decision of handpicking Uhuru Kenyatta as his successor. A splinter group led by Raila Odinga, Professor George Saitoti. Kalonzo Msioka, Najib Balala, William Olentimama left Kano to join hands with the NAK to form the Juggernaut National Rainbow Coalition, NAC. <laughs> Kenyans were grieving for change that even Kibaki's accident had no impact on his campaigns. And when he returned home from treatment in London, the message was clear. Emilio Mwaikibaki was the only hope for the change they yearned for. It was not just the size of the mammoth crowd that counted. A strong scent of change filled the air and only a miracle will save Kanu and its candidate Uhuru Kenyatta. The die is cast. I wonder whether anybody after today will have any doubt in their mind that NAC will form the, the next government. The change is inevitable. And I want to urge the Kanu leadership to recognize that fact and to decide how it is wishes to exit itself. Captain, na naibu wake walikuwa wamepata majeraha kwenye michezo. Wameingia kwenye kiwanja kama tayari zimechafunga bao mbili kwa yai. December 30th, 2002 was literally a moment of national rebirth. 
In Kibaki, the country breathed afresh and hope engulfed the air in Uhuru Park, Nairobi and across the country. Mimi mwai kibaki na hapa kwamba nitatenda kazi zangu za urais wa Jamhuri ya Kenya kwa uaminifu And as Kibaki was handed the military ceremonial sword Kenyans were optimistic My name is Enoxicole and I am the Kenyan historian.